to introduce our speaker. His name is Frank Tamel, right? <coughs> and Frank is an employment and training specialist for the Wisconsin Workforce Development. Uh, mm -hmm. Workforce Development. He has a work at the history dedicated to extraordinary customer service in retail, business to business, and in the public sector. Mr. Tamil possesses a thorough understanding that an employee's greatest source of pride comes through effectively representing the company's interests as well as serving its customers. And just a brief little blip on his background, he's been a business owner. He founded and managed a successful retail sporting goods business. He is a motivational... He is a motivational speaker. Are we supposed to go to the air raid shelter now? <laughs> <laughs> he wrote and facilitated the curriculum for an adult education uh, course. He also conducts different workshops with emphasis on personal branding, which he will speak on tonight. Issues and answers for mature job seekers, uh, uh, effective resume writing, and others. He also acts as a consultant. He um, coaches business clients. He's also a teacher. He has developed curriculums in various courses, students, and as also adults. And he currently teaches adult education courses in entrepreneurship and business ethics. He also is a writer, and he also is a sales representative. And so we are most fortunate here to have Frank speak to us tonight. Welcome, Frank. Thank you, Sue. Um, just a little sidebar, you're talking about how God was able to, uh, God's timing is perfect. You've got to remember that the Apostle Peter said that uh, a day is just a thousand years and a thousand years is a day with God. So if you waited 15 years for an answer, in God's time it was a few seconds. Um, the title of a workshop that I do for the Department of Workforce Development is Memorable You. How, sh how, <laughs> how shameless self-promotion can help you get a great job. Now, as Christians, we sometimes have difficulty promoting ourselves. You know, we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to uh, um, downplay our strengths. You know, uh, we should be meek and humble and so on. But uh, on the other side of the coin is uh, we are confronted with a lot of competition when it comes to finding employment. Approximately 1,000 people will see every single job posting. So if I'm a company, I post a job on the internet website, 1,000 pairs of eyes will see that. Of those 1,000 people, 200 people are going to start applying for that job. Of the 200 people that start applying for the job, 100 will complete the application. Every one of those 100 applications will have a resume attached to it. 75 of those resumes are going to disappear. They'll never land on a hiring manager's desk. Of those 25, the hiring manager will look at them for 10 or 15 seconds and will go, no, 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 maybe. And they'll select anywhere from three to six people to call in for an interview. Of those, they'll pick one to three to call in for a second interview and one person will be offered the job. And 80% of the people who are offered a job will take it. So what are your chances of getting a job? One in a thousand? Well, actually, the reality is, is that you have a very good opportunity because I'm going to give you some pointers as to how to be one of those 25 whose resume is considered, one of the three to six who is being interviewed, and uh, your chances are going to be much greater. Okay, so you bear with me. We're going to be talking about some things that are a little bit, uh, for some of you, are going to be things you've heard before. We'll be talking about some things that some of you are going to find unusual. But that's okay if you would just uh, keep an open mind. Uh, hopefully, uh, the information I give will be beneficial. How many people here are looking for a job at this time? All right, good, good. How many people have a job and you'd like to change your career? All right. Well, in order for you to be a viable product, in order for you to be a candidate for a job, okay, it's important that you market yourself or brand yourself. Branding is the lifeblood of every successful organization. No product is introduced to the public with a lot, without a lot of consideration in branding that product. Branding defines the features and benefits that the product provides. 
Branding communicates those features and benefits to an appropriate audience. It delivers the goods to the customer and branding sets the price. This pen costs a dollar. Okay? Now I can go out and buy a Mont Blanc pen for a hundred dollars. They're both right. Why is a Mont Blanc pen worth a hundred dollars and this little uh, Pilot G2 pen worth a dollar? Branding. All right, there's not a hundred dollars worth of materials in that Mont Blanc. By the way, you know how to keep from losing a pen? Pay a hundred dollars for it. You'll never lose it. <laughs> Branding can be so powerful that the name of the product defines the activity. Pepsi and Coke had a thing a few years back, they may still be doing it, where you go into the mall and there's a kiosk and they have a bottle, two bottles of cola flavored soft drink, you know, and they ask you to try them and, and see which one tastes better. Ever, ever seen that or experienced that? You know Pepsi always wins? But Coke outsells Pepsi in every market worldwide. In fact, Coca-Cola's branding is so powerful that the majority of people who go to a restaurant and they want a cola-flavored soft drink to go with their meal, they'll say, I'll have a Coke. And there are other products like that. For example, if I was going to uh, send a box, send a package somewhere, I might say, hey, listen, uh, would you FedEx this for me? It's a brand. How about I need some copies of my resume. If some of you are, might be going to a, a job fair and want 15, 20 copies of your resume, you're going to go Xerox them, right? That's a brand. If you sneeze, I might offer you a Kleenex. Or if I need the text of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, I know, I'll Google it. Every one of these are brand names that have defined the activity. All right, so now, uh, how would you like to be a Ralph? Hey, we need a Ralph. Anyone here named Ralph? Okay, we need a Ralph to do this job. You could be that kind of a brand. Oh, by the way, branding can actually hurt you. I just want to do a little, little story here. Branding can really hurt you. Back in the 60s, I was selling cars, and uh, I sell, was selling Chevrolets, and, and Chevrolet had a neat car. It was one of the first true compact cars called the Chevy Nova. Familiar with that car? Chevy Nova? And it was really cool because it came in a lot of different configurations. You could get it with a two-door model and a four-door model. You get it with a sports package and a V8 engine, a four-speed and bucket seats. Very, very popular with the youngsters. Sold like hotcakes in the United States and Canada. But they could not sell a Nova in Mexico. And the reason for it is the marketing department of the largest automobile company in the world didn't realize that Nova in Spanish means no-go. <laughs> Okay, so marketing can hurt you if you don't do it right. Now, employers don't hire people if they don't need help. Would you buy a set of tires if you didn't need tires? Would you? Anyone here would buy a set of tires if you didn't need tires? Nobody? Amazing. Well, what if they were on sale? Would you buy them then? Of course not. All right. When an employer posts a job on an internet website, a job site, it's because they have a problem. They need something done that they can't do themselves. They need a product to address that need. You're the product. So now, how many people here said you wanted a job? Raise your hand again. Okay, how many people need a job? How many people in this room deserve a job? Sure, you're nice people, need jobs, deserve jobs. Employers don't care. They don't care how badly you need a job. The only thing they care about are, are you going to provide the features and the benefits that they require to get that job done. So you need to stop thinking of yourself as a nice person who deserves a job and needs a job and start thinking of yourself as a product, as a solution to the employer's problem. And if you can get into that mindset, you will be well on your way to finding that good job. Now, it would be great if employers applied to you. Let's run an ad in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel or in the Waukesha Times, whatever it is, okay? And the headline will be, Employer Wanted. Must have living wage, health insurance, paid vacation, and a generous retirement plan. Then we're going to go home and sit there and wait for the phone to ring. How many people think you would be successful doing that? 
Hmm, that's interesting because everyone who's sending resumes out and sitting home waiting for an employer to call is doing exactly the same thing. If you're mailing your resumes out online, posting them online, putting them on job uh, um, um, applications and so on, and sitting home and checking your email to see if you got a response, it's exactly what you're doing. Employer wanted. So what you need to do is change your thinking. You need to become proactive in seeking the job rather than reactive. Just checking your emails is being reactive. Okay, so how do you be proactive? Well, there's a couple ways to do it. And the best way to do it is to utilize a marketing mix that's used by advertising agencies and marketing experts worldwide. There are five controllable branding factors when it comes to marketing. Now, there are things that are out of our control, right? Acts of God, weather, traffic accidents, disease, illness. But there are five things that marketers have discovered that they can control. They can control the product, they can control the preparation, they can control the promotion of that product, the place in which they market that product, and the price of the product. Well, let's talk about these. Product. You're the product, right? We've already established that. Because you're the product, you need to develop a USP, a unique selling proposition. Think of yourself as a product. Well, what makes you a better choice than the other people who have applied for the job? Remember I said out of a thousand people who see a job posting, 200 will start the application process, 100 will complete it. You're one of 100 people. What's unique about you? What's your unique selling proposition? What skills and features do you provide? Now every, every single product has features. Your skills are your features. And every feature provides a benefit to the person who uses the product. This is my favorite pen, it's a dollar. It has four things about it, features that provide benefits to me that I like. First of all, it has a clear barrel on it so I can see how much ink is in there. And I know that if I can't see any ink anymore, it's time for me to get a new pen. It has one of these little retractor buttons which means that when I put this in my pocket, I'm not going to have a big black stain on my shirt, right? This pen has a little clip on it. I put this clip in there, put it in my pocket, I bend over and tie my shoes, and I'm not going to drop my pen on the floor. And it has a rubber thing on there that my fingers connect with when I write, so I can write more words with less fatigue. All those features provide a benefit. What are your features? What are your skills? And what benefit does the employer derive from the skills that you have? And then last but not least, what are your accomplishments? Mm -hmm. Too often we get hung up in, I had a job and these were my duties. I see it on resumes all the time. CNA in a hospital, list their duties. Take vital signs, make a bed with a patient in it, feed patients, okay? Report to the doctor with a change, when there's a change in condition. Okay, I'm the HR person looking at your resume saying, I know you can do that. You're a CNA for crying out loud. You better be able to do that. So instead of telling me what your duties are, I'd like, I want to know what your accomplishments are. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. The next one is positioning. Every corporation that, pro that markets a product develops a target audience. Okay, what audience will this product appeal to? Now they can do it in two different directions. They can come up with a product and then determine what the audience is, or they can look at an audience and find out what and decide what product will appeal to that audience. Now, as a marketer, I know what kind of radio stations you listen to. All I have to do is know is, is your gender and your age. And I have a pretty good hunch as to what radio stations you listen to. So if I'm trying to market to women from the ages of 35 to 64, I will go to certain radio stations knowing that the majority of my audience will be women 35 to 64. Okay, well you have to have a target audience. Your target audience is the employer that's in the industry that you're trying to get a job in. Okay, now you have to identify then a set of competitive advantages upon which to build your position. Okay, now, if your resume is the same resume for every job application, you're making a mistake. 
If you're using the same resume every time you apply for a job, you're not going to have a lot of success. And the reason for that is every company has unique requirements. The job posting will list the, 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 all the things they want you as an employee to be able to do. Your resume must be targeted to that list, which means that you'll change the resume a little bit for every job you apply. Right? You want to take and show the skills that they're looking for on your resume. You need to effectively communicate the advantages to your target. You have to find a way to articulate to the target why they should hire you. And the position that you have should be modified as your audience changes. If you can do those things, you're going to be a much more successful job seeker. How many people have an elevator speech? One, two, three, four. For shame on you. An elevator speech is one of the most important things you can have if you're looking for a job. Well, what's an elevator speech? An elevator speech is a very, very short uh, presentation talking about yourself that you can present to an employer. Imagine you get on an elevator with the hiring manager of a large corporation. It's a company you want to work for. You get on the elevator with them. You know who they are but they have no clue who you are. You take a look and they punch the 10th floor and you figure six seconds a floor. In 60 seconds, can you introduce yourself and at the end of the ride, have an interview? Schedule an interview? Yes, you can. It's an elevator speech. You talk a little bit about what field or industry you're in, the position you held in that comp company, the capacity in which you served, what, what sets you apart from the competition, a little bit about your skills, and can we set a date right now for a face-to-face -face interview? Have you got your cell phone handy? Let's take, pull up our calendars and set that date. Okay, that's your elevator speech. When do you use it? All the time. Job fairs. I work job fairs. A lot of times uh, I have to uh, fill in for someone who's not available, so I'll go to a big job fair and we set up a little table for, for Job Center of Wisconsin, you know, and we, we'll have uh, some jobs from our website and we'll have maybe uh, encourage, uh, literature to encourage people to register on our website because they're looking for jobs and so on. And about 90% uh, of the people come and they look down. What kind of jobs you got? But every once in a while, Someone will come in, smile, shake my hand, introduce themselves, tell me what industry they're in, tell me what kind of job they're looking for, talk a little bit about their skills. Now, which of those two people am I going to give my business card to? I've got a lot of customers. I don't have a lot of room on my dance card for new customers, so which one will I give my business card to? Okay, you need an elevator speech. What if you go to a wedding or a funeral and someone introduces you and the person they introduce you to is the head of a corporation or the shop manager of a large plant or the sales manager of a large retail organization? And they introduce you just to say, hi, my name's Frank, nice to meet you. Elevator speech. What if you call a company and you're calling the HR department to get some information and you get that, hi, I'm either on the phone or I'm waiting for my desk, please leave a message. Elevator speech. Now, an elevator speech is a script. You need to write it. And you need to practice it. And then when you go to that job interview, and one of the first questions the interviewer says is, what can you tell me about yourself? What do you use your? Elevator. elevator speech. The next one is promotion. If you want to launch a product, you need some things. You need a door opener something to pique the interest of the consumer. It's always very helpful to have a product brochure. Packaging the product is critically important. In fact, companies spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to make sure that the packaging is attractive enough to make you want to reach for it to take it off the shelf. You need a sales pitch, and you need a follow-up system. Okay, if you want to sell products, that's what you have to do. You're selling yourself as a product. You need a door opener. Your door opener is your cover letter. Your product brochure, that's your resume. Packaging, what do you look like? How are you dressed when you go for that job interview? Sales pitch, that's the interview. And the follow-up, that's your thank you letter. If you can master those five elements, you're going to get that job. Every one of you is going to have a job very quickly. But you have to master those elements. Now, 
dynamic cover letters. How many people use cover letters? Okay, good. Now, of all the people who use cover letters, I bet you 90% of you aren't doing it right. What is a cover letter supposed to do? It's supposed to draw attention of the hiring manager to your resume, right? Okay, most people start their, not, raise your hand if you've done this, dear sir or madam, dear hiring manager to whom it may concern. Ever do that? Uh-huh, don't. <laughs> Never do that. I'll tell you why. Everyone else does. The dirty little secret is when everyone in town is beating on a drum and you want to be heard, you sound a trumpet. So I'd rather have you use that person's name. Doesn't that make sense? How do you find the person's name? How about making a phone call to that company? Hi, my name is Frank Tamil and I'm writing a letter to your hiring manager. How do you spell that last name? Now why do I do it that way instead of saying what's the name of your hiring manager? Because in some organizations, they're not allowed to give you the name. We can't give you that information, sir. But they're not told you can't tell me how to spell it. Well, his last name is J-O-H-N-S-O-N. -S oh, thank you, thank you. We're, you're a lifesaver. I really appreciate that. By the way, what, what was that first name again? Now, if you can't find that name, go to LinkedIn, go to Google it. You can't find it. How about starting with greetings? Isn't that more friendly than dear sir or madam or to whom it may concern? Or good afternoon. Now your cover letter must have five elements. Most people start a cover letter talking about themselves, right? Okay, well, what job are you applying for? Why don't you tell me that first? I, this letter is in reference to the position that you advertised on JobCenterWisconsin.com for a customer service representative. Now, as the hiring manager, I look at that and, well, this person's applying for a customer representative job. I know right up front. Section two, two or three sentences about why you applied at that company. I've heard a lot of wonderful things about your organization. I've met people who work there and they love working for you. Your products are marvelous. In fact, I use them. Working for you would be my dream job. Number three, on the job posting is a list of the, all the things they want you to have, right? There may be 15 or 20 things, the things that you, requirements for you to be considered for employment. Pick five or six of the ones that line up with your skill sets. According to your posting, qualified candidates must have five years experience, know how to run a cash register, have a, have a background in men's fashion. Okay? You list the things that line up best for you. Now, if, if they say you've got to have, be able to do uh, 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 Jabberwocky software and you don't know how to do that, don't list that. Okay? You're not lying. <laughs> you don't want to lie, ever. But don't list it. Because a lot of times your experience is going to offset the, what you're missing. Okay? All right, so you list those things. Now, section four. I meet or exceed your requirements because... I've got eight years experience in retail. I know how to run a sophisticated point of sale computer system. I not only know about men's fashion, I know about women's fashion, shoes, and baby furniture. Okay, now here's the hard part. Section five, most people, now not if, you don't have to raise your hand, just not if I'd say it right. Most people finish the letter saying, looking forward to hearing from you at your earliest convenience. How many people have done that? Okay, how about changing and saying, I'll contact you in five business days to make an appointment to meet with you to discuss my qualifications in detail and in person. And then five days later, business days later, you make that phone call. Ring a ling a ling, hello XYZ company, hi this is Frank Tamil. Um, I would like to speak to your hiring manager please. What's this call with regards to? Well they're expecting my call. And so now the receptionist calls the hiring manager. Hi, uh, Mr. Tamil's on the phone. Mr. Tamil? <coughs> Mr. Tamil? Well, he said you're expecting his call. I am? I can just see this guy looking at his calendar, checking his papers. Did I forget something? He answers the phone. Uh, hello? Mr. Johnson, this is Frank Tamil. Five business days ago, I wrote you a letter. And in the letter, I said I was going to call you today, and that's why I'm on the phone right now. 
think you can do it? Be bold in Christ, people. Be bold. Okay. Now, how does a resume function? Well, it's your sales brochure. How many people get sales brochures in the mail? Raise your hand if you get sales brochures in the mail. Okay. Now, you get clothing brochures and they're on a model and they always look perfect, right? You ever notice those models never have warts? <laughs> they never have wrinkles and dark shadows under their eyes? Now, we look around the room. We see people with wrinkles and freckles and warts and dark shadows because we're human. <coughs> well, they take those models and they airbrush them, you know, and they, they, they use Photoshop and get rid of that stuff and lighting to make sure everything looks great, you know. They want those models to look perfect so those clothes look perfect and so on. Well, your resume is your brochure. You need to hide your warts, hide your wrinkles, and show yourself in the best possible light. All right? Now, every sales brochure has four major elements. A headline. Well, what's the headline? That's the position you're applying for. Right? Your headline is screaming out, hey, customer service representative. They have a photo of the product. Your product photo is actually your personal profile. It's a word picture of the kind of employee you're going to be. They have a list of product features and benefits. Your skills. Those are your features and the benefits that the employer will derive. And then every brochure usually has an about us section about the company. That is your work history and education history. So that's your brochure. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. What information do you want to include on your brochure? Well, first of all, you want to have your contact information, right? Name, address, phone number, email address. You want to have that on there. 72% of hiring managers, according to a recent survey, will reject a resume if it does not have an appropriate email address. So if your email address is Big Stud Daddy or Red Hot Mama or something like that, you want to change it to an appropriate business-oriented email address. And you can get those free, Google, Gmail, and so on. The position for which you're applying under your contact information, a personal profile instead, oh, how many people use an objective on their resume? Objective, looking for a position with a growing company where I can utilize my vast array of skills, right? Objective, how many people, that sound a little bit familiar? In other words, you're telling the employer I'm looking for a job. Of course you're looking for a job or they wouldn't have your resume in front of them right now, right? So you're telling them what they already know. Plus, you're saying, I want you to meet my objective. Give me this job. No. You want to tell them what you bring to the table. So instead of an objective, you need a personal profile. How many years of experience do you have? Your work ethic. A little bit about your background. You know, information that makes me attracted to you as an employee. Wow, this is a person who has this experience and can do this. I'm going to have to take a closer look at this resume. So change the profile to uh, your objective to a profile. <coughs> Under there, you're going to list your skills. What do you know how to do? Go to the job posting, find the skills that they require to do the job, and put those in there. Why do you do that? Wait, quite simply, that a lot of resumes are scanned. They, they send the resumes out to scanners. The scanners will scan a resume looking for keywords and phrases that match the job posting. So, and, they, and they'll say, okay, now we're going to score the resumes from 50 to 100 points, 50 being no matches, 100 points being 100% matches. And the HR department will say, only send us resumes that score over an 85. Remember I said 75 out of 100 resumes never meet the hiring manager's desk? That's why. That's one of the main reasons. Okay. Under your work history, under your, oh, by the way, one more thing. Microsoft Word is not a skill anymore. Don't put it on there. If you don't know how to do Microsoft Word, you don't know how to use a computer. Or if you, don't, if you know how to use a computer, you've got to know how to use Microsoft Word. That's, it's a standard in the industry for word processing. So you don't put it on there because we already know you know how to do that. But if you know Microsoft Office Suite 2014, well, that's powerful. Put that on there. Uh, work history, name of the company, city, state, job title, years worked. Only go back 10 years. How many people have had a job for 30 or 40 years? You can raise your hand. I'm, I'm 70. I, I've had a job for 50. Okay. All right. If you've had a job for more than 20 years or 30 years or a, a number of jobs, don't put them all on there. 
I, I can do math. I'm a 32-year-old hiring manager or HR professional in a company, and I take a look at your resume, and I see a 35-year work history, and I know you probably started working somewhere around the age of 20. This person's over 50 years old. I might have a bias against people in that age group. Only go back 10 or 12 years on your resume. Okay? You don't have to list every job you've ever had. If you're looking for a job as a welder, but you were a dog walker 22 years ago, you don't want to put that on there. It has nothing to do with welding. Okay, then you don't list your duties. We talked about that. List your accomplishments. Accomplishments come in three categories. Challenge, approach, results. Every job has, how many people have ever had a, had a job in their lifetime that never had challenges? I'd love that job, right? Okay, every job has challenges. And you had to meet those challenges sometimes daily. Any of, anyone here a server in a restaurant? Okay, what are some of the challenges associated with being a server? Grumpy people. I had a waitress tell me one time that the most grumpy people to come to their restaurant were the ones that came right from church on Sunday. Okay, grumpy people. What was your approach to dealing with that? Oh, okay. Well, now, though, if you were going to deal with it, you'd be a smiley person. You would make sure that everything was right and make sure the order was correct and conscientious. And Okay? <laughs> if, if, if you use the right approach to dealing with those customers, what do you think the end result would be? Pardon? How about increased tips, repeat business, happy customers, re, re, you know, people coming back? Okay, we're going to move very, very quickly. After that, I want to see your responsibilities. What are the things that the employer trusted you to do? And then below that, education, licenses, and certif certifications. Packaging. How do you appear? How are you going to dress for that job interview? Ask. Mr. Johnson would like to have you come next Thursday at 2 o'clock for a job interview. Will you be available? Yes, I will. What's proper attire? Ask the question. Now, most of us know how to dress for an interview, right? Ask the question anyway. It shows that you care enough about that job to ask. Business formal, business casual, or casual? Those are your three choices. Business casual, that would be a coat. Business formal would be a suit. This is casual. Khakis, shirt, tie. Women, age appropriate, stylish, Modest. Okay. All right. Uh, interview. Not an inquisition. It's not two people screaming in your face with the heat turned up in a little room like good cop, bad cop. When you get into the interview, greet the interviewer. Repeat their name when they introduce themselves. If it's a committee, do it with everybody. Thank them for taking time to meet with you. One thing that HR people don't like doing is interviewing for jobs. They don't like to do it. Make them feel at ease by thanking them. Uh, listen carefully to every question that they ask and take a moment to think before you talk and only answer the question. You get yourself into a lot of trouble if you start to ramble and give too much information. Always emphasize your strengths and downplay your weaknesses. Only admit to weaknesses that you've already overcome. On the last job I struggled with Here's how I overcame it. That's why you should hire me, because that's not an issue anymore. Never talk about weaknesses that are going to affect you on this job, because you won't get hired. Never dwell on, how many people had employment experiences in the past that just were unpleasant? Maybe co-workers, bosses, working conditions that were horrific, right? Don't talk about it in a job interview. Don't dwell on that at all. Never speak ill of a former employer or divulge their corporate se secrets. Because if you do, they won't hire you, the new company. If you're willing to tell their secrets, you're also willing to tell ours. Talk about what you can do. Never talk about what you have done. I don't care what you did 20 years ago. I want to know what you can do now. And be enthusiastic. Of the, of, Every company has certain wants and certain desires when it comes to candidates. And if we had a longer session, I could go over those. 
but the one thing that they desire, they almost never get from a candidate, and that is enthusiasm. People excited about the opportunity they're giving them to, to, to allow them to come in for that interview. If you can be enthusiastic and excited and genuinely show them how much you appreciate the opportunity, you will find that they're going to be much more receptive to you. All right. What do you want to emphasize during an interview? Your value to the employer and why you want to work there. Your knowledge of the industry and their mission. Where do you plan to be five years from now? Well, I plan to be a very valued, important employee and possibly in a leadership role. It's the easiest answer you can give. When you talk about, I saved the company money, I trained people, I, I increased sales, I want to know how much, what percentages, and how many. Be specific on that. Let them know that your sights are set on this specific job. A lot of companies had this position available, I'm here, because I want to work for you. And then let them know you'll be following up. When do you plan on making a decision? Well, we want to make a decision by next Friday. Great, I'll call you on Wednesday. Okay. Be proactive. Now there is a job, and I'm just going to, I'm going to move very quickly here, but there is an a employment manager who finishes every interview with this line. I'm sorry, I just don't think this is the right fit for you. Every single interview. He could have the perfect candidate sitting there and he's just chomping at the bit to get this guy working for him. He finishes the interview by saying, I'm sorry, I just don't think this is the right fit for you. Most people will say, well, I appreciate your time. I'm sorry you feel that way. Thanks for the interview on anyway, and they'll leave. But once in a while, someone will say, I think you're wrong. I'm here for a reason. Here's what you're not seeing. And they go right back and fight for that job. That's the employee he wants. Because that employee is, wants that job. That proves it to him. Okay, superstars don't give up. Are you a superstar employee? Don't give up. Okay, at the end of the interview, they're gonna say, do you have any questions for me? If you say, no, I'm good, you're not gonna get the job. <laughs> okay, so here's some questions. What do you expect me to accomplish in the first 60 to 90 days? What will my, fo will my focus be on collaboration or individual accomplishment? What are some of the challenges that are going to face me in this position? You'll notice I didn't use the words, if you hire me in there. Proactive. It's my job. It started on the day of the interview. You just haven't said the day I'm supposed to start yet, right? This is my job. Okay, so those are safe questions to ask, but there are also, also some hard questions to ask that you should be asking. Are there any reasons I'm not fully qualified for this position? Ask that at the end of the interview. Now, why would you ask that question? Anybody? Because you want, you want to know if there's something you need to learn. Okay, you want to know if there's something you want to le need to learn. Were you going to say the same thing? Okay, now that they had a chance to interview me, what reservations would you have in hiring me? Or do you see anything on my background that would hinder me from being hired? Okay, you, that one reason that you ask is so that you do a better interview the next time, right? But there's a more important reason. I think you're wrong. Here's what you're not seeing. I'm here for a reason. Right? Thank you letters. We got two ladies sitting at the back table here. They both interviewed with me. I want both of them, but I only have one position. And I'm torn. I don't know which one I'm going to have. So that lady on the left sends me a thank you letter. The one on the right doesn't. Do you think that would tip the scales? Yeah. Yeah, it would. You want to write a thank you letter. The day of the interview, send that thank you. Now, if the recruiter is over 35, handwritten, under 35, email or text, OK? Uh, place is another one. Uh, job postings and recruitment advertising. Jobcenterwisconsin.com is probably the best website in the state for finding jobs. We have over 70,000 jobs on there and we'll never sell your information. Notice when we started using Indeed, Monster, Craigslist, and all that, you were getting all kinds of spam and calls from schools and stuff. We won't allow employers to use your information in that way. Uh, job service recruiters, executive search firms, networking groups, social media, LinkedIn. How many people have LinkedIn accounts? Okay, 80% of employers go to LinkedIn first before they post a job. Price, compensation. How do you talk about it? How much compensation do you require? It's tough. If you ask for too much, they're not going to hire you, right? If you ask for too little, you're going to be walking around the plant someday realizing you're the lowest paid person in the company. 
All right, so what you need to do is you need to think in terms about what the benefits package is. Usually, wages are never talked about in the first interview, am I right, recruiter? Usually that's talked in a subsequent interview, but they may say how much compensation do you require. There, that's a minefield. You could fall into a hole with, with that one. So you should do some research. Find out what the job pays and the low end and the high end. And then talk about a range rather than a specific. Also, I've had people sit in these meetings saying, hey, I'm not gonna work for less than $25 an hour. I worked at a company for 35 years to get to $25 an hour. Now I'm looking for a new job. I'm not gonna take less than that. What makes you think that a hire, a new hire is gonna pay you what it took you 35 years to acquire? You have to start lower and work your back, way back up when you're starting. I know for a fact I've had six careers in my 50 years. Well, I'm more than 50. But. All right, I'm finishing. Two more minutes. Number one, employers don't hire skills. Everyone thinks they hire skills. No, what's the first thing you hear when you're a youngster looking for a job? You don't have enough experience. Employers want experience. Experience always trumps skills. If they're looking for someone with an associate's degree and you don't have it, but you've got 25 years of experience on that job, you don't think they'll consider you? Absolutely they will. I got a job working with the state of Wisconsin. I'm kind of a psychologist and I'm a counselor and I'm a mentor. I don't have a degree in psychology. But I've got 50 years of practical experience in the real world, running a business, owning a business, and working with people. And that was my trump card. Don't fish in the same hole as everyone else. Chase people, not jobs. You're out there looking for jobs, posting jobs online. You got to do it, right? But what do you do after you've posted that job? Did you make that phone call? Did you follow up? Chase the people. Okay. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. You need to be networking with people, telling them you're looking for it. And be specific about what you're looking for. Just saying, I need a job or I'm looking for a job isn't enough. You'll tell me I need a job and I'm sitting at the barber shop and the guy next to me has an accounting firm and he lost his base account and he's looking for someone in accounting and I don't know you're an accountant, I'm not gonna be able to refer you, am I? But if you come to me and say, hey listen, I'm an accountant and uh, my firm closed and I'm looking for employment. Now I'm in a barber chair and the guy next to me says, we're an accounting firm, we lost our main account. And I can say, hey wait a minute, I know somebody who has eight years experience in accounting. And, and they're looking for a job. So be specific when you network. Start at the top and work your way down. Don't accept no from someone who can't say yes. You walk into a place, you heard a rumor that they were hiring, and you walk up to the reception desk and say, are you hiring? And she says, no. Oh, really? Well, if you were hiring, would I be talking to you? No. Let me talk to that person. Okay? And last but not least, you've got to have the want to. How many people have heard the name Alan Oggs? I'm surprised that in a Christian group, no one's heard it. He wrote a book, you gotta have the want to. Alan Oggs was a preacher. He was a master preacher. One problem, he was born with severe cerebral palsy. It was so bad. I mean, he was so crippled when he was born that the physician told his mother to starve him to death because that was the humane thing to do. Alan Oggs wanted to be a preacher. From the time he was a young boy, he wanted to be a preacher. He went to seminary, he went to Bible school. He walked in the first day of Bible school and he talked to the dean of the school and the dean laughed at him. Alan Oggs wrote this book, you got to have the want to. And in the book he talks about when he was 10 or 11 or 12 years old, his dad bought him a bicycle. His cerebral palsy was so severe that he would have these spasms. And if he like, was playing with Tinker Toys, they'd flip all over the room and stuff. He had that bicycle and he determined he was going to ride that bike. And he'd get on that bike and that bike would buck him off. That's how he described it in the book. It bucked him off. Of course, we know that the bike didn't do it. And he'd lean that bike up against the fence at the end of the day and he'd say, you stay there because I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to ride you. And then the next day he'd go out there and that bike would buck him off again. He was all bruised up. Every day, you stay there, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to ride you tomorrow. And one day, he rode that bike. And he graduated from Bible school. Several years later, the dean of men for the Bible school had passed away. Alan Ogg stood in front of 25,000 people. Keynote speaker. 
at the National Convention for the United Pentecostal Church International. Looked up, called the name of the dean and said, you should see me now. Don't give up. If you want a job, use some of these techniques, you'll find that you'll have more success. Don't be discouraged. Some of you will have a job in the next two weeks. That's my prophecy. Some of you will take a little longer. Everyone in this room who wants a job will have a job. And that's my promise to you. Thank you for your attention.